please. Welcome to today's meeting of Healthier Communities and Adult Social Scares, Adult Social Care, oops, uh, Policy Development uh, Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Kate McDonald and I'm going to be chairing this meeting today. I'm going to hand you over immediately to, to Jenny, who's going to say a bit about the whole context of the meeting. Over to you, Jenny, please. All right. Thank you for logging on to this Zoom video conference of the Healthy Communities Scrutiny Committee. I am the Democratic Services Officer for this meeting and I'm assisted by my colleague Kate Sheldon, who is the host of the virtual meeting. We will proceed to introductions and housekeeping in a moment, but just a, point, a couple of points to note. This meeting is a public meeting and in alignment with the new regulations which permit meetings to be held by remote means will be live streamed for the public to view. To make the meeting run as smooth as possible, can I please ask that participants in the virtual meeting room to leave your microphone on mute when you are not speaking. When you want to speak, please raise your hand to the camera and only unmute when the chair indicates that you can speak. If at any time any member loses the ability to hear or be heard, they must alert the chair or host as soon as possible. You may see members looking to the left and right of their screens. This is because they may be looking at an additional screen or device containing agenda papers, not because they are distracted. I will now hand back over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I'm just going to um, start off with introductions. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself just based on your proximity to me on, on, on my screen. So uh, the other Kate, would you like to introduce yourself, please? I'm Kate Sheldon, Member Supporters of the Big Money Show, and I'm the host of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, hello, I'm Sue Alston, Councillor for Forward. Angela, please. Angela Ardenti, I'm Councillor for Broomhill and Charvel. Jackie. Jackie Drayton. <laughs> Thank oh, you very much. Jackie today. Yeah, sorry, yes, I, I'm usually, you, used to yeah. Jackie, uh, Councillor Sater being here. Sorry, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm uh, Councillor Jackie Drayton. I'm the Cabinet Member for Children, Young People and Families, and I have public health in my portfolio responsibilities too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Stanbrookshaw, the Policy and Improvement Officer that supports this committee. Jenny? I am Jenny Skeber, I'm the Democratic Services Officer, here to take the minutes. Lewis? Hi, I'm Councillor Lewis Dagnall, Councillor for Gleams Founding Board. Lucy? Hi, I'm Lucy Davis, uh, Chief Officer, Health Watch Sheffield. Jane? Uh, Councillor Jane Dern, Southie Ward. Alan, please? Alan Law, First Part Ward, here is a substitute. Gary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Gary Weatherall for Sherry Green and Bright Side Ward. Martin. Martin Phipps, Councillor for City Ward. Gail. Councillor Gail Smith, uh, Mosborough Ward. Adam. Uh, yeah, Councillor Adam Hurst, West Ecclesfield. Talib. Uh, Councillor Talib Hussain, Bangu Ward. Mike, I'll come back to Mike. Yeah, no, I'm getting there, Chair. Sorry, okay. Chair. Uh, Council Mike Grabble at uh, Richmond Ward, and I apologise, my collection's really flaky today. So if it's OK with you, um, I'd, I'd like to turn off video because that seems to make it a bit more stable. OK. Uh, I'd, yeah, rather you could so... keep with, I'd rather you could keep with us, and if that's the only way you can do yeah. it, that's fair enough. Thank you. Eleanor? Sorry, I, I wasn't prepared to unmute there. Um, I'm Eleanor Rutter, consultant in public health. Um, and also, along with um, Councillor Drabble's apology, I just need to say I'm also at home, obviously, home educating with a vomiting child. So um, forgive me if I have to go and... Assist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we will do. This is real life. <laughs> um, life on the wild side. Uh, Steve? Uh, Steve Ayres, Council for Graves Park Ward and Deputy Chair. Abdul. Good afternoon, Abdul Kayoum, Council for Firth Park Ward. Uh, and hello, Greg. I didn't expect you, but please introduce yourself. 
Um, uh, you're sorry, I could go away if you want, but um, uh, Greg <laughs> Felder, Director of Public Health. It's good to see you. Um, it's good. Can we um, have apologies for absence now, please? Who's got those? Is that you, Jenny? Just one apology for absence from Councillor Jack in the Saturday, uh, Councillor Alan Moore is a substitute. We've got an apology for Vic Bowden. Yes. Uh, she's going to be late. Yes, yeah. And, and Mike, I know you've got something that you might have to pop out for a, an urgent um, appointment. So both of those people have been in, in touch. Anybody yeah, else? Thank, any? thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Any, so um, any members of the public will, um, if, if somebody has to come and go, it's not because they're being ill-mannered, it's because they've got um, other commitments and they're doing their best actually to balance things. Um, any other um, apologies? No? Okay, that's fine. Uh, exclusion of public and press. As far as I'm aware, we don't have any items on the agenda which require this. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Are there any uh, um, matters on the agenda that anybody wants to, anybody would like to um, uh, identify uh, interest in? Well, I know you're all interested, but I meant one which is potentially prejudicial. No? Okay, that's great. And then on to the um, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, and those are starting at page nine on your agenda pack. Can I just ask, first of all, are people content that these are a, an accurate record of the meeting? Or have we any um, amendments? Can I take them as an accurate record? Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to go, you know, I usually whip through them page at a time. Um, please. Uh, raise, your hand, um, raise your hand or call out if you want to raise anything on this. Uh, starting off with page 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, thank you, that's brilliant. Um, and we do have um, our, our question from a member of the public. Um, do we have the questioner? Is, is, is the questioner here, Kate? Yes, Chair, it's just coming through. Oh, okay. Mr. Butcher. Yeah, so we've got a question from, from Mr. Butcher, and we're just he's just coming into the um, meet, joining us in the meeting now, is he, Kate? Yeah. He is, Chair, he should be there now. Hello, Adam. Can you hear us? Just let the system settle down. Hopefully you're not on mute. If you are, take mute, mute off, please. Hello, Adam. Hello. Okay, um, oh, hello. hello. Well, nice, nice to hear you and, and see your picture. I hope you're well. I'm very well, and, and happy new year, um, Councillor Kate. Thank you, thank you very much. Nice to see you. Uh, you've got a question for us today. Uh, I do. You, it's on you, item seven on your in your. Yes. Um, that's right. Would you I like can, to read out your question, Adam? I can do. One second. How can we talk about health inequalities when we don't talk about people with a learning disability and in general other disabilities regarding health inequality within Sheffield? Okay, thank you. And I understand, Greg, you may have um, some comments, not an answer, but um, some comments in response to, I mean, personally, I think that's a really good question. And I don't think we should uh, talk about um, health inequalities without talking about disabilities in any way. But Greg, would you like to um, to comment on that, you or Eleanor? Or um, perhaps Jackie as well? Yeah, thank um, Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Adam, nice to see you. Uh, happy New Year. Um, um, the, we can't is the honest answer, um, and I don't think anyone is. Um, the the uh, item that's on the agenda today doesn't have a um, chapter, for want of a better phrase, on disability. That doesn't mean that we're not going to talk about that, nor does it mean that disability isn't important. Um, uh, and I don't think anyone would pretend otherwise. So um, um, uh, 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 people who have a disability, physical and learning disability, have poorer health outcomes. The end. That's not right. That's not acceptable. And uh, I don't think we're going to have a conversation that excludes disability. Okay, Jackie, did you want to comment at all as the cabinet member for all age disability? Yes. Yes. 
please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. And thanks, um, Adam. Um, Happy New Year to you. Hope you had a great Christmas break, too. Um, it's a great question. We're very quiet, uh, Jackie. We're very quiet. Oh, right. Yes, didn't we all, Adam? But um, thank you very much for coming and, and posing this question. And I think um, I'm, I wouldn't add to anything Greg said. We all know, don't we, that the, 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 the health chances for people with disabilities are, are less than people without them. So I think anything we can do, and I'm sure um, there are lots of um, inequalities we'll be seeing within the COVID this, this year, this past, past year and going forward, that we have to make sure we address going forward in our strategies and our, in our policies, both as a council, but also as a health service as well. Um, and I know that the chair of this committee and the committee will be looking into this and making sure we're doing everything we can as we all will, but thank you very much. I think Eleanor wanted to say something as well, Chair. Thank you. Eleanor? Yes, it's a, it's a very small point, which, which seems trivial, but was quite big for those of us working on this, this piece of work. Um, particularly with hidden disabilities, there's a, a lot of, it's, that's not recorded in the data. And I know data sounds really, really dull, but we can only report on what we have data on and, and, and the recommendations coming from this, we're really pushing um, different organisations to ensure that they're collecting as rich and complete data as possible. Um, and, and and disabilities is one of those areas. So I'll just reassure you that that was kind of noted in, in the discussions that we had. Okay, Adam, are you comfortable with that response? I guess what people are saying, we haven't forgotten, even though it's not explicit um, in the paperwork. So for example, um, the, there's reference to disability in the, um, the marmots, um, uh, bringing back fear uh, report as well, which is, is referenced in, uh, for this session as well. Uh, we, you know, we do understand that a lot of people with disabilities have, have, have there's higher levels of depression and so on. And we have talked in previous sessions as well mm -hmm. about the impact on, on be, being able to access care and, and also the impact of confinement as well on people with different disabilities. And, and, and press the, um, uh, the CCG on some areas of, of, of learning disabilities as well, because I know Health Watch are particularly passionate about that as well. So I'd just like to reassure you that that, that it is actually um, part of our thinking. Um, I also to thank you very much actually for coming to uh, to ask your question and to remind us of a really important topic. Are you comfortable with that response or is there anything else you would, I mean, you're welcome to to, to stay in the, um, the, the room while we're having this meeting or watch the rest of it. And, and if there's anything subsequently that you feel that, that, that we've forgotten, please get in touch with me. I'll, I will, I will, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it through the, the usual channels. Okay, that's fine. And, and, and thank you again for, for, for coming to the meeting and asking your question. It's my pleasure. Okay. And happy New Year to all of you. And to you. Thank you then. Bye, Adam, uh, for the time being. Oh, I'm sure we'll see you again. That'd be great. Um, now moving on to the uh, the main item on the agenda. Um, we've we've um, circulated a background paper, and, and um, just just to to be clear that this is meant to, intended to be a, a, a background paper because it is very broad. Uh, it is a paper that went to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, and obviously today we're not going to be able to cover that whole range of, of um, topics that, that, that is included in that. So, so, my, um, so the first thing is that, that, that obviously we're going to have to be a bit focused today in terms of the, the health inequalities issue and potentially uh, wanting to see some, you know, how, how that's going to be taken forward. Uh, Greg's going to, we're not going to go through this report, it is a background report as I've said, but Greg and Eleanor, I've got a brief presentation for us, I understand, um, and you're just going to um, um, introduce the issues. So, I mean, things will be moving on quite quickly. I suppose the final thing is um, that the, the Marmot um, review, which has come out fairly recently, is an incredibly useful document. And, and in a way, it would have been much better if, if that had come, well, it couldn't come out earlier. And then we could have said, you know, this is a picture nationally, what's the picture locally? But I'm sure those will be um, themed in, in terms of some of our questions today. So just try to make sure that um, issues, I mean, for example, um, 
uh, domestic violence has already been um, covered uh, by one of the other scrutiny committees and the children's stuff will also be uh, either have been covered or will be taken up by the children's scrutiny. So let's try and keep us, our um, questions and comments to focus on the adult health inequalities. That's my suggestion anyhow. Now, I know Steve agrees because he's been in touch with me about it. So, so that's um, for, for both of us today, but that's our summer advice to you. So thank you to our um, expert panel, as I like to call you. That, that gives you a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Craig, uh, uh, Jackie and Eleanor today. So who's going to lead off with, with the um, brief introduction then, Greg? Thank you. Well, I'll do, I'll do two minutes, Jen. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Eleanor, who's got some, uh, who's got some slides. She's far more organised than me, and she's got some slides. Um, so, um, at the, at the, I suppose COVID has impacted on health inequalities. It's exacerbated existing inequalities, um, and it's shone a very, very, very bright light on inequalities that have been there. That's take, taken as a given, but it's very important we remind ourselves. Um, there, there is not one big thing that will solve this problem. Um, lots of people want me to have a big red button by the side of my desk. It doesn't exist, sadly. Um, um, then if there is one big thing, it's read and reread Michael Marmot's report and implement it at the end. And my standard answer to anyone asks me, who, what should we do about health inequalities is reread and implement Mike Marmot's report. Um, uh, uh, it, the, the most recent one is an iteration on the 10 years on. Um, his 10 years on report was very badly timed. Um, it was published in February 2002. 20 uh, that does seem like a long time ago um just at the time when um covid was becoming um a thing um, and what a thing it became um, as a result mike marmot's 10 years on report did not get the traction it needed and deserved um, um however if you reread it there's nothing in that that is um uh, that, that isn't relevant today uh, his key point um is that um the the last 10 years and the um the funding settle, settlement for local government has undoubtedly had an impact on healthy life expectancy and the gap between best and worst. However you want to cut that, rich, poor, disabled, not disabled, mentally ill, not mentally ill, the, 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 the last 10 years has had a big impact. Um, um, the, there is plenty going on to um, address health inequality. The real answers are government and structural. Um, um, we do our best in various shapes and guises, and I'm doubtless, doubtless we'll pick up some of those things as we go. Um, but but um, the real answers here are government and structural, definitely. Um, there are little things that we can and are doing, and I think we'll pick up some of those today. The, the, per the last thing I'll say before I shut up um, is that the, the purpose of the piece of work that Eleanor and others did was um, to, to really get under the skin <laughs> of the impact of COVID in lots and lots of different areas. Um, very long, very detailed piece of work. And I'm going to hand over to Eleanor, who just private messaged me to tell me to shut up. So I'll shut up now and let Eleanor carry on, if that's OK, Chair. OK, thank you. Over to you then, Eleanor. I and mean, I'm sure you wouldn't say that to Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was about, I was hoping, trying to say, no, I wouldn't, Kate, but no, that's exactly what I said to him. No, but, but actually, the reason I said that to him was because in two minutes there, Greg just said exactly what I'm about to say in a slightly longer presentation. So actually, if my vomiting child does the thing and demands my attention, just, I can assure you that Greg just said it all. But anyway, just, just, just very slightly calmer and slower. I've got a set of slides I will go through. Kate, are you doing the slides? Is somebody there doing? Kate Sheldon, yes. That's, that's brilliant. Hold on, I just need to find my. Now I've lost my. No. Does anybody know if I can minimize this meeting? Exit full screen. That's what I'm trying. Okay, okay. I'm there. That was your screen where you can, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it. Okay. Um, all right. So I don't need to introduce myself again. And Greg has said I'm here really by virtue of the fact I was leading or and coordinating this piece of work, which has involved quite literally hundreds of um, people from across the city. Um, next slide, please, Kate. 
Um, so I've put there the question as it was put to me. Um, and the core of this really is going to be, it is based on these impact assessments that were carried out really over the summer. Um, but then we're hoping to, to move on from that really to talk more generally about inequalities. And I'm going to be as quick as I can. So there's plenty of time for questions. Um, next slide, Kate. Thank you. Um, so just very, very briefly, a bit of background. I don't need to tell anybody that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, what certainly crept up on me, I don't know about other people, is the fact that the pandemic is now a year old. Um, it, it feels like yesterday when the, it, it all started. Um, and knowing the impact this has had on communities in Sheffield, the fact that it's a year old is really a very, very sobering thought. Um, just as a reminder, the first case came to Sheffield in February last year, and we had our first death in March of last year. To date, we've had more than 800 deaths, um, many of those from our most, most vulnerable communities. Um, also, don't need to remind anybody here that we're a very, very divided city pre-pandemic. We've got some of the most affluent and the most deprived wards in the country um, here in Sheffield. Um, and that's played out in inequalities in health. We've got a 10 year difference in life expectancy um, and a 20 year gap in healthy life expectancy between the best and the worst areas in Sheffield. Um, so that's the context in which the Health and Wellbeing Board commissioned a series of rapid health impact assessments around spring of last year. Um, the aim, as Greg said, was to document the impact of the pandemic. Um, that was in order to be able to mitigate against the effects of further waves and lockdowns and also to pr provide evidence um, for our response to the pandemic and any recovery activities. Um, next slide, Kate, please. So we talk about the health impact assessment, actually it can be viewed as a series of mini health impact assessments, which were focused on sp specific areas of concern and the themes are there on the, uh, on the slide there. Uh, they were produced by 13 or so task and finish groups that were made up of, as I said, interested people, but actually the contributors were in excess of a hundred people. Um, the final document is more than 400 pages long. It's incredibly um, detailed, but the, the, the wealth of Sheffield experience that is in there is really quite impressive. Um, what you've seen prior to this meeting is the summary version. Even within that summary, there's way too much detail for me to talk about today. And Kate, as you said, um, we're not here to talk so much about the specifics as the, the inequalities in general. Um, but I'm hoping you've all had a chance to read that just to see so, some of the granularity that was coming out there. When we set out doing this piece of work last spring, there was a real hope that we were going to document not just the bad things that had happened, but the good things that had happened. And, and it, you know, it, it can't be denied. Sheffield's shown itself to be resilient and caring and loads of good things have come out of the pandemic. Um, different days of ways of working and traveling and supporting each other. It, 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 it's, it's good stuff. Um, but let's not make any mistake, the impact over the last year for Sheffield has been devastating. Um, and the good things that have happened um, have really not been equally or fairly spread across the city. Um, and just one really clear example is, is working in, in flexible ways. Working from home works really well for many, many people. I assume that we're all at home today. Um, that, of course, is not a luxury that's afforded to people in lower paid jobs. Um, many of them will have been furloughed. They're now facing unemployment or they'll have continued to work in frontline jobs with an associated risk of infection from COVID-19. Um, so yes, good things, many good things, and they do need to be built on in recovery, um, but we need to make sure that, that that's focused in the areas of greatest need as well. Um, next slide, Kate, please. Um, sorry, not that one, the previous one, cross-cutting themes. Um, so again, I don't want to take up time talking about things um, that you've you've had the opportunity to read in the paper. In, in, in the paper, um, you're not going to be surprised to know that there are a few key themes that ran through all of the subject-specific health impact assessments. 
I think the key message for today is the same as it always is, that all of those cross-cutting themes are intertwined and clustered um, and all add up to contributing to a worsening of inequalities that, that already existed in the city. Um, I think, as I touched on earlier, I think it's really sobering to note that this report was written over the summer, really. That was to the end of the first wave and after the first lockdown. Um, and actually looking at it now, a lot of the language was how we'll rebuild now we're in recovery. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, this we're a year into this and we're in our third wave, third period of lockdown. And the vaccine offers great hope, um, but the pandemic is still ongoing. Uh, next slide, Kate, please. Um, Okay, that little fella, we're all kind of really, really familiar with. Um, and we're in the middle of a pandemic, it's caused by an infectious disease. And so we can all be forgiven for being really, really familiar with that picture. And we're all really familiar with language that 12 months ago, we couldn't have imagined using um, herd immunity and, and end proteins and mutations and that R number. We talk about the R number like we talk about the weather. Um, that is understandable. But again, let's make no mistake, this is a pandemic of inequality. Um, and I was just sitting preparing slides thinking, I wonder what this pandemic would have looked like in Sheffield if everybody shared the same life experience as those of us living in our most affluent and privileged communities. I think it would have been very, very different. So, Kate, if we can just move on to the next slide. Um, I apologise not, this one is old news. Um, I wish we could get bored of looking at this diagram, but we can't. Um, quick, quick bit of revision, I think we all know this. The factors on that diagram are the things that determine anybody's health experience. A teeny tiny weeny bit of that is actually the health services. Um, in excess of 80% of our experience of health is based on the entirety of our social, physical and economic circumstances. And it's the unequal spread of those factors across the city that cause inequalities in health. The particularly bad news that we're also familiar with is that those factors cluster together. Um, so, for example, people living in poverty tend to live in poor quality housing. They tend to have poor experience of education. They end up in low paid work and thus inequalities. They pass from generation to generation and are exacerbated. Unfortunately, that bad news got worse with um, the arrival of the pandemic. Next slide, Kate, please. Because it is those very same people who are affected so badly by the clustering of those negative factors who are also now most likely to become infected with COVID-19, more likely to have poor outcomes and are more likely to be affected by the adverse um, outcomes of lockdown measures. Um, so we are just adding, the, the, the pandemic has added terrible news to bad news. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. Um, I think that, that's, that's a quote there that is, it, it, it's traveling around and just speaks volumes, I think. It sort of says it all. Um, that, of course, came as no surprise to the authors of our health impact assessments whose recommendations did include very short term, almost immediate operational type mitigations, um, but also focused a lot on how we eliminate the fundamental underlying inequalities. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Um, a total of 103 recommendations were made to the Health and Wellbeing Board from those 13, um, 13 key themes. They were accepted in, in, very, in a very specific way by the Health and Wellbeing Board. The broad thrust, thrust of those were completely accepted by the Health and Wellbeing Board, who absolutely welcomed the health impact assessment. Um, I, I was just looking earlier at the, the wording in number four. It, it sounds very, very wordy. And I don't want anybody to think that that meant that that, that was a sort of weak support. That actually was, was absolute support from the Health and Wellbeing Board, but was recognizing that some of the recommendations fall out with um, the 
authority of the Health and Wellbeing Board. So actually what the Health and Wellbeing Board was saying is that they absolutely agreed with the overall recommendations that came out of this piece of work and they were committing to work with partners um, to eliminate inequalities in, in health. So just finally, next, next slide and drawing to a close, just wanted to touch on the Marmot um, COVID review, um, obviously produced at a national level, the great Professor Sir Michael, you know, a great, a great lead, very clear, comprehensive document. Um, I think what struck me was the absolute similarities between his review and ours, although I accept his, his looks a bit better than, than ours. Um, and, and actually what particularly struck me is that of the 71 recommendations that came out of his review, only three of those actually referred to coronavirus as an infectious disease. So talking about vaccination or PPE or those kinds of interventions, actually the majority of the recommendations there were focused on short, medium and long term actions to eliminate um, underlying inequalities in health and this is it's just a recurring theme we've got to get rid of inequalities so moving on to the very last slide um, turning back to local work actually again that's the the recommendations in the Marmot report are very closely well mirrored um, to the ambitions that were made in our 2019 health and well-being strategy um, the basis is there for what we need to do. I think what we need to be sure is that the pandemic doesn't, uh, the pandemic is taking up a lot of our attention um, and we need to try and make sure that we're continuing to work with all of our partners um, to deal with what's fundamentally underlying all of this. I'm going to leave it there. Greg, I don't know if you want to add any words or if we just want to open up to questions now. Greg, is there anything you wanted to add? Or Jackie? I think I can add. Okay, we'll, do, we'll take the rest. Of, Jackie, was there anything? Or just come no, back to a question? No, that's fine, thank you, Kate. Yeah. Uh, let the members uh, ask yeah. their questions, have yeah. their comments. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take questions in a minute. Quick. I'd just like to ask before we get into it, is there anything that was distinctively different um, in Sheffield to the national picture, which was uh, well presented with lots of evidence in, in the Marmot report? I just wondered if there was anything that, that we feel was, it didn't feel that to me when I was reading it, but I'm, I'm asking you as the experts, any, no, of the, no, no. any of the things that Marmot found, was the picture in Sheffield different from the national picture, I think is the question that, I'm, that should be articulating. Um, and hand on heart, Chair, we, we don't know because we haven't done the same level of detailed analysis that my Marmot has done because he's got a, um, a, a fairly substantial team to do that. Yes. But, Go, going through the Marmot, the various Marmot reports over the years, particularly the most recent one, there was nothing in it that surprised me that made me think, oh, right, no, maybe Sheffield is different. So um, I think it's probably fair to say that Marmot's findings holds true to Sheffield or Sheffield holds true to the Marmot, Marmot findings, whichever way you want to do that. Thank you. OK, questions now from people. I've got um, Adam, Steve, Jane... I'm writing that down. Anybody else at this point? You'll get another opportunity. So we'll start off with questions and, and then we'll come back to recommendations and possible, re uh, sorry, comments and potential recommendations if anybody's got suggestions. So questions first. Adam first, please. Okay, well, I, I did take quite a few notes as I was going through, but I'm going to keep this as brief as I can so other people can get in. Um, I think that the, 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 I was interested that, was it Marma? Of all the recommendations, so few actually were, well, included a uh, reference to COVID being infectious. And I think as I was going on and also looking at the background papers, in some ways, I wouldn't say it's the least of our worries, but that's one that we do at least begin to have a, a solution to with vaccination. So the questions that I really wanted to go into are... The longer term health effects, we know that if the infections are, effect, uh, are worse in the more deprived communities, and the headlines are always about the people who die, they're not about the people who have long COVID and the long term effects it has on, you know, their functioning in society. And also, if we're looking at, and I think one of the other things is private schools 
pupils have more access to laptops, computers, and online learning than people in the poorest schools. So they will inevitably create longer term, more health inequalities because they're actually exacerbating um, inequality. So the questions I was going to ask are, um, on the digital exclusion, we're doing, we do a lot of, uh, of welfare work. We have a lot of hardship funds for things like food and heating. Are we going to start looking at maybe including digital exclusion, people's ability to afford decent broadband packages and relevant equipment so you can have a parent working at home and two kids working online? Does this need to start coming into our thinking on how we support our most deprived communities? And the other one, I think is very obvious, which is how do we work seamlessly across everything, literally from employment and benefits advice to uh, ensuring people have proper access to health education and advice that they need. And so it's the last comment I would make would be on exercising. If you live in Grenaside, it's fine. I'm not paying, uh, um, my payment to my health club is, uh, is suspended. So that's 20 quid a month. And I can walk into open country in five minutes from my house. Not the same as if you were in other parts of the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We would like to, um, to kick off with those questions then. Uh, so I'm all muted, so I'll go first. I've blocked the Eleanor <laughs> State on mute. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, digital exclusion. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, it's not the, the, in in this space. There are lots of things that do plain aren't my area of expertise, and I don't know what the uh, of the council could be or couldn't be with regard to digital uh, digital exclusion. But I agree, actually, um, and uh, there probably are things that we have done. Um, in that space to try and bridge that divide. It may well be the case there is more that we could do, but I'd, I'd need to ask people that, that kind of know that space far more eloquently than I do to give you a proper answer on that one. Um, can I just come in on that bit? Because I, I, I can answer that question and, and Jackie might want to do something on it as well. But in our previous sessions, like with, particularly like on with the on general practice and so on, it was absolutely obvious that the digital um, exclusion is now becoming much, much greater in terms of the barrier to access to services and, and it's been exacerbated. Uh, I know that um, uh, Councillor Fox is going to be convening a citywide summit, um, including our partners, to try and do something across the city um, to address um, this issue because it is such a big strategic issue for the city. So as a council and as an administration, um, we're going to take that up as a, as, as a major issue affecting the city. There's lots of other stuff going on in particular wards as well, but I just thought that um, Jackie might want to just come in on that point and then we'll go back to Craig. Jackie, did you want to... Yeah, it was just, yeah. just to, to uh, echo what you'd said, Chair, and, but yeah. also to say that obviously schools and the government has put money into... Um, put money into uh, uh, laptops, but also connections, but not enough. But the, we do are working, um, Councillor Abdusan Mohammed and, and, the, and the schools um, officers are working with um, public um, uh, businesses, uh, you know, private businesses rather, to help get the more computers in. Because it, and also we know it isn't just about computers, it's about connection, but it's not even just about connection and computers. It's whether you've got a space in your home, if the, you're living in a, two bedroom plat as a single parent with three, you know, three kids in, on, you know, fourth floor of a, a tower block, you know, perhaps do you have room where everybody's on the same, at the same time, uh, different rooms can be different rooms. So it, it's much larger than that. Um, I was going to say, if I could just jump in, because I'm really pleased to hear that, Jackie. I, say, I think we are working seamless. Are we working seamlessly? I, I would hope we are. And I would hope we all need to come together on all the issues that we're talking about today. Thank you. I was just going to very quickly come because I, I, I'm really pleased what you just said there, Jackie. But I think what's really important, we look at everybody's got a smartphone these days. So I think, oh, well, everybody's connected to the internet. There's no problem. Actually, I bought a new computer because my old computer wasn't quick enough to do the stuff I wanted to do digitally. It's, you know, so it is, it's the quality of connection, it's the quality of equipment that people are getting. And I think we've seen with the school dinners, uh, we have to keep a very close eye on that. Sorry to butt in, I'll mute myself okay. now. Thank you, I'll let, I'll let Craig, was there anything else you wanted to 
Um, I mean, there, there was a bit about seamlessness. Jackie's commented on that. And then there was just a comment really on exercise, access to um, opportunities for exercise being varied across the city. Um, so on the seamless thing, I agree, I agree with Jackie. We all aspire to it. We all know it doesn't always work as we want it to. Um, we can always aspire to and should try and be better. But th that will never be perfect. And that will always be a um, work in progress. We can always be better at being seamless, um, me included. On, on exercise, I think the reality is there is probably um, unequal access to green space. Um, um, you know, that let's not, not be, be around the bush there. I think that, that is, is a fact. Where investments have and are being made as a rule they're being made in some of the more deprived parts of town at the expense of some of the more affluent parts of town um so um you know, certainly i know full well that where we've made investments through the move more strategy they're very very focused on some of the more deprived parts of town and and i'll go beyond geography there very focused on um, um uh, improving levels of activity in those who have mental health problems or those who have a disability for instance that's been the case for quite a long time and i think that will be continued to be the case but the reality is but certainly with regard to green space and other forms of, of um, um outdoor activity it is uh, unequal and uh, that's easier to uh, easy for me to say and quite difficult to rectify but uh, we do what we can with the levers and the resources that we've got it's just I'm taking I, more sorry, exercise Jeff, and Jeff, spending less I, money. <laughs> I I've got a lot of questions. So I'm sorry, yeah, I just want to come in. And not, that far be it from me to um, uh, uh, go against the Director of Public Health. I have to say, I live in Burn Grieve Ward, which is where I represent, and I walk across the road I'm in a, and, and I'm in a medieval wood. And actually, in Sheffield, we are very fortunate that in a lot of our areas, we have green spaces and woods and, space, and parks where we can go in. And that's one thing we have got here in wherever we live across the city. Thank you. OK, thank you. I've got um, Steve next. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the first thing to say is I, I, I do recall when the uh, Marmot Review was first um, published um, and having read the 10 years on report, it struck me um, how little we'd progressed in addressing some of the equalities in, in the original report. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm still reading through the, the impact of COVID, the, the Marmot report on the impact of COVID. Um, but it, it, it seems to me that, um, you know, COVID has, has simply, or what COVID has done is to highlight some of the um, inequalities um, that, that we've known existed since the publication 10 years ago of the Marmot Review. Um, in terms of the so, so uh, in, um, I suppose my questions are about what are the next steps um, with um, this major piece of work, which um, which has been, you know, all the work, hard work that's been put into into this this um, summary document. Well, the, the main document to which we've seen the summary today. Um, it, I mean, it's I'm, I'm in I'm in danger of straying into um, what I said to Kate prior to the meeting about touching on, on other issues, but it's such a broad ranging um, piece of work. Is it proposed to um, pull out action points for different partners to look at and enact upon, perhaps even putting in particular resource in particular areas? Is that, I'm just trying to get a view on what is the next step with this. Incidentally, I do, I do notice that in the recommendations uh, alongside each theme, uh, there don't seem to be any recommendations under, under the last two themes in the report. The one, one, number 11 was end of life and mental well-being, and number 12 was BAME communities. I'm just wondering why there were no recommendations in the boxes on those two themes. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll, uh, did, did, with permission, um, I'll hand straight on to Eleanor, who did most of the work. So I'm she's going to, to say that, yeah. you know, because thank you. Okay, Eleanor, would you like to um, have a go, please? Yeah, the, the, the answer about the next steps is um, will particular partners be taking on specific actions? That, that part of the question. The answer is yes. 
um, and some partners already have done. So actually there were quite a lot of recommendations that what, what I talked about in the presentation, the kind of very short term operational type things, a lot of that was already being done actually by the time the report was, was taken by the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, what, we, what, what the Health and Wellbeing Board are committed to doing really is to take chunks of recommendations related to particular subject areas and spend more time reviewing them to make sure that what we're, we're currently doing or what the Health and Wellbeing Board are currently doing includes all of the recommendations that came out. But I think the point I was trying to make really is that the overall, the recommendations that came out of the health impact assessments were saying the same thing as the ambitions in the health and wellbeing strategy just in two different lots of language. So yes, we absolutely will make sure that things won't get missed. Um, but the thrust was deal with inequalities and the health and wellbeing strategy is the basis for doing that. There's nothing as, that, that's come out of the health impact assessment that would suggest the health and wellbeing strategy isn't fit for purpose. We may need to tweak a couple of little bits, but that is what we as a city need to do. Um, there was another part to the question. Oh, why end, are recommendations? End of life and you know, those, those particular, yeah, BAME communities, end of life and mental health, I think. And was, to be absolutely honest about the recommendations, I can't answer your question. What we've been short of is um, ca capacity in terms of producing documents. What if you, if you want to see those, I can absolutely make sure they get to you. Different the, the summary version and the very short summary version and the full version were all finalised at different points in time. Um, and, and this is the benefit of being Michael Marmot and you have a good team behind you. I'm afraid <laughs> they, 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 the recommendations are there and I can make sure you can see them. And I apologise that they're not in that document that you had. Can I just say they are in the document, page 80, there's in, but it's in a box, not separate. It's in a box, page 80, there's recommendations. Right. On the BAME, on BAME, definitely. Okay, thank you. Steve? Sure, can I? Okay, yes, Greg, come in there. Jackie's made the point that there are some recommendations on, on the, uh, in, in the end on the page 80. To, to their credit, the NHS has taken on a lot of the work actually on recommendations around the BAME population in, in particular and great credit to them because they have done a huge amount there. Um, clearly, I think the NHS can't undertake um, work around the structural determinants of health because the NHS are a health and social care delivery organisation. Um, um, the, 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 the thing that's probably not um, um, emphasised sufficiently on the BAME population is that the, the, there's been a disproportionate impact of COVID on the BAME population. So you're undoubted. There's no two ways about that. Um, th that's a story of inequality rather than skin colour. So the, the, the key thing is how do we best connect and engage with the BAME populations to correct structural inequality. Easy for me to say, difficult to do, I accept. Um, and um, Sarah in my team and a number of other people have done some really, really useful work on re re reconnecting um, with the BAME community and building building up trust with, with BAME community organisations up and down the city. Um, the, that is work ongoing. Um, the work of um, um, Kevin, Fenton's, um, Kevin Fenton's report on the impact of um, COVID on the BAME community is, is one of the guiding pieces, one of the guiding, one of the guiding bits of research for that. I, I mean, in short, I think most will accept we will try our best to implement Kevin Fenton's recommendations on um, um, uh, from his report. Some of them are quite easy to um, implement next year. Some of them are very, very difficult to implement, but no one disagrees with them, actually. Um, the only other thing, I, if I may, whilst I've got the floor, um, um, the, the things haven't progressed since um, Marmot's first report 10 years ago. Um, yes, um, that is entirely true. And often flip that on its head, um, and given the, the 10 years that local government has just had, um, they haven't got massively worse either. Um, and I think that's testament to the 
combined efforts of local government, voluntary and community sector, both the organised and the um, uh, the informal voluntary community sector and the NHS, that things haven't got a lot worse over the last 10 years. So it, you can see that both ways, but you are right, things haven't got better in 10 years, but uh, um, I see it both ways, actually. Thank you, Steve. Did you want to come back? Or are you no, no, I'm, uh, no, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'll let somebody else have a go. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, Jane, Councillor Jane Dunn, you next. Thank you very much. Uh, Greg, I want to build on the question that I asked at full council, which is about vaccinations. OK, uh, things have moved on since Wednesday, as they're moving on quite dramatically every day. And on Monday, the government announced that they will be working with on the vaccination programme, local councils and local public health, which is not what was initially said. It was, you know, we always knew they would, but it was like a national programme. Today, we've just it's just been announced that it's over one and a half thousand deaths in the last 24 hours. So that's the highest ever. So we are doing quite well in Sheffield and I know we're not being complacent, but it's about the vaccination program. How do we make sure that this program doesn't widen the health inequalities of the city? Especially since we know how difficult it is communicating with certain communities that A, the vaccine is safe, and that it will actually work. I mean, when I was last allowed in work, I did have two of my clients were both in the BAME community. They both were very skeptical about the vaccine. And it was, these are really intelligent, highly informed people, but what's circulating in the community? So, and also it's kind of with certain areas that have got a very aging population and with others that haven't. So how do we make sure that we can influence to make sure that while it's been doing um, fair and equitably, that the vaccination programme doesn't widen the inequalities because it will be hard for people to work if they've not been vaccinated? Could they be punished, especially in the lower paid work? Do you know, so it's, it's, that isn't probably for your remit in here today, but it's what influence can we have without kind of um, upsetting the rest of the country, basically. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, so, <laughs> um, so um, the, uh, the NHS, an NHS England-led vaccination programme, um, um, I, I think most local authorities, including ours, have been very, very, very clear. Um, the NHS can't deliver this programme optimally by itself. Um, um, you know, it is the NHS that will be sticking needles in people's arms. No two ways about that. I, I wouldn't want the local authority or the voluntary community sector um, doing that, unless they've been vaccinated, trained, in which case I'm fine. Um, but, but it will be clinicians sticking needles in people's arms. The, ca the, the, the council and the voluntary community sector can get to places that the NHS can't. Um, and the council and the voluntary sector can provide resources and the infra uh, resources and infrastructure to enable the vaccination to be done as speedily as possible. Um, and um, uh, and is very actively involved in that. And uh, just this week, we've got the first meeting of um, um, I forget what we're calling it, but basically the uh, Sheffield Vaccination Programme Board, um, which brings together the different bits of the NHS with the council, with the voluntary and community sector, to agree a very clear, very coherent plan for vaccination, which um, honest answer is does not exist fully at the moment. So, um, um, it, it, so we'll bring that together as a Friday. Um, Operationally, vaccination is proceeding at some pace in Sheffield at the moment. Tens of thousands of people have received the first dose of the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer vaccine, and, and credit to the amazing work of the NHS that's, that's achieved that. Um, there are dangers that with a focus on numbers, quite rightly a focus on numbers, um, there's a sort of focus on the easier to find people to get mm. through the system at the expense of those that would be less likely to turn up for this or any other vaccine programme. We need to address that. Um, what, what I think we can't do is rewrite the national prioritisation criteria um, because uh, being brutally blunt, Jonathan Van Tam will come and give me a menacing stare. Um, and I don't want a menacing <laughs> stare from Jonathan Van Tam. He's, 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 he's well known bruiser. Um, so, and I don't think it's worth actually rewriting those criteria. Once the AstraZeneca vaccine is in the hands of as many GPs as possible, 
they are and will go for broke on vaccinating as quickly as possible. Um, um, some some of the Twitter active GPs in Sheffield have been posting today uh, that they, you know they're doing thousands in a week mm. now, and it, at that speed it won't take long to get through. So our job, and particularly my job, and it's a job card accepted, and I've just discussed this with the CCG today actually, is what can we do using tried and trusted health promotion, comms and engagement, mm. and other techniques to maximise the uptake in those groups of the population that historically we don't find very easy to reach. I was going to say hard to reach, but you know what I mean. We need to reach yeah. them. Uh, black and minority ethnic population is a, is a good one, and I'm well aware that there are lots of fears and concerns about the safety of the vaccine circulating on social media. Some people have some very legitimate concerns, and we need to address those head on, straightforward, straightforward conversation about um, safety, side effects. There are some side effects. All vaccines have side effects. Uh, uh, tri trivial in the main versus the effectiveness of the vaccine. It prevents people dying. There's no two ways about that. Uh, there are some plenty of hoaxes on social media as well. I've seen plenty of them. Um, um, uh, and I won't go head to head with the anti-vaxxers because that just creates oxygen and confuses everybody. But we'll calmly and consistently point out that this is a safe vaccine um, um, and it's definitely an effective vaccine. And we will um, actively work with um, very localized community opinion leaders to, there's no point wheeling me out into Burngreave because there's no point. So we'll work with community leaders in Burngreave, including councillors in Burngreave, um, to, to, to be advocates for the vaccine. That's how I think we'll get coverage as high as possible. Um, but what I fear, if, if le left to path of default, um, again, to over-characterise this, um, cover coverage or uptake will be really high in Doran Totley and really low in Firth Park, and that's not acceptable to any of us. So we ha we have to be responsible for that. So um, the, 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 that's broadly wh where we'll go with, with maximising vaccine, vaccine uptake, and I'll shut up there. That's all right. Can I just add to that? I mean, Steve, you'll know that I've been in contact with Greg just to to think about um, whether or not we can have a look at this um, from a scrutiny perspective as well. And we need to resolve that. We don't want to stop anything, criticise anything, slow it down. But but there's an issue about transparency and, and, and stuff as well, which I think we could help with in terms of reassuring people, actually. So well, we need to conclude that discussion. The point I wanted to make was access as in physical access, because the, yeah. the, the, the PCN uh, location in, in my area it's just impossible for, for older, poorer people actually to to get to. Um, so I, I do think there are some issues, but we you know we need to resolve those because we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. You know, it's a it's a key weapon. And um, Jane, did you want to come back on your question? Yeah, it was picking uh, up Gail. slightly on what you said. Uh, thank you, Greg. It was about the harder to reach and where you do have. I mean, we know they're rolling out new centres all the time, and there's been a big lot of um, people wanting it in every single pharmacy. Not every pharmacy is big enough to have a vaccination program and people be able to access their prescriptions and everything. And we do have outer places where we know like Woodhouse and places like that, where you've got aging population, a lot of disabled people. So the more localized it is. So it was really, are we sharing this data you know, with the NHS to help them make sure that we have that program? you know and um obviously a lot of people would be vaccinated in the home which is safest as well do you know um especially with um people that have got numbers of children how do you queue outside a vaccination center and i am a little bit split on whether we should be vaccinating 24 7 for, for health and safety reasons, do you know, as well. Queuing up at night, how do you make sure that's safe everywhere? Do you know, but I mean, I'm not saying that can't happen in certain places, but obviously there's a big push at the moment to just do it every hour of the day. And I think it has to be, take a step back as well and make sure we keep momentum up, but we're also making sure that we're not missing out areas like Burngreave and, my area of Southie, et cetera. 
Oh, I, I agree with all of those points, Jane. On on, on site selection, they're NHS site they're, they're NHS site selections, they're not ours. Sometimes they are imperfect for all sorts of reasons, and sometimes there, there are access problems. So as and when we hear about access, and I'd like to know about access problems, uh, we, we'll pick them up directly with the NHS and work out a solution. There's no there, there are a few problems that can't be solved on this one, but it will be di difficult and a bit bumpy. I too am split on 24 hours. Um, I, I honestly think that given a free hand and I, I, I think we will get there the vaccine will get into the hands of, of most gps and they will treat it like standard flu jab the astrazeneca vaccine the pfizer vaccine is more difficult but the astrazeneca vaccine they'll treat it like flu jab this year we got 85 percent coverage of, of flu flu vaccination in the over 65s they are unheard of levels as a result there's almost no people in hospital with flu at the moment which is also unheard of so um uh, the the hope is if we get to that stage our GPs and pharmacists, I don't think there's much pharmacist vaccination with the COVID jab at the moment in Sheffield. I've seen one or two sites nationally, but we'll probably go there. That massively speeds up the implementation. Um, but, but it is, you know, let's not underestimate it, it's certainly the biggest logistic exercise that the NHS has ever undertaken. It is doing it at speed. It won't be perfect. Um, all of the time there will be bumps in the road and it will take a few months to get fully vaccinated population as, as a minimum I think. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a number of people who want to come in. I've got Martin, Gail, Lucy and Sue. Martin was this on, did you want to come in on this point? Because I just, if, if there are some of the others wanted to come in on this point I would, I would bring them in there. Was it, um, I've got you Gail, yeah. Uh, did you want to come in on this point Martin? Um, mine's kind of a general okay, question. I'll, I'll bring that. I'll bring you back then. So, Gail, did you want to come in on this part, this point, this topic? Yes. Or um, another thank, one. Thank you, Chair. No, this this point. I mean, Greg knows that I feel very strongly that in my area we have picked the wrong place to uh, do vaccinations for the older community because it's very hard to reach unless you've got a car and there's no car parking, but I've spoke to the CQC, they're not gonna change their mind. But my point on that point is, local councillors know their area and we want to work with these people to get, uh, you know, to get this uh, vaccine out. And we've all got a lot of knowledge. So I would emphasize that please speak to us because we're all prepared to help. That's one point. There was a, an article today in the Star saying that one GP in Sheffield believed that we could get through these vaccinations in Sheffield within two months. Is that realistic or is that pie into the sky? Thank you. Um, um, on, on the involving local councils, I 100% agree. Um, we'll endeavour to do that. Um, it will, as I say, it won't always be perfect, but, but we'll endeavour to do that. On the, the two months, um, I'd say it's very optimistic. It's probably possible, but I'd say it's very optimistic. I don't know is my honest answer, uh, uh, Gail, because I, I've not done the, the, the numbers myself. But I, I, it, it's theoretically possible, but it would require a very, fairly strong following wind to get that done in two months. It is a, a mammoth logistic exercise. It normally takes three months-ish to do the flu jab campaign. This is much bigger than the flu jab yeah. campaign. We're pushing on it a lot harder, but equally primary care still has to provide um, care to people who are poorly with all sorts of other things. So yeah. I'd say it's a bit optimistic, to be honest. Do you think it's possible, Greg, that we could extend the time to 10.30 or at least 10 o'clock? I don't believe that it's realistic to, to be vaccinating people in the middle of the night, but we could do it a bit longer than, uh, than 12 hours is my view. I don't. I don't know. I on, I honestly don't know. I'll 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 pick the opening hours up with the NHS on Friday when we have the the first meeting of the program board. I'm conscious that we're now getting into um, vaccinations, which is obviously relevant, but we have got other things as well. Sue, was your point on this? Because otherwise, I'll go back and take Martin's question. I've got Lucy as well. Um, I've I've got a point on this and a couple of points on other things. So take Martin, and I'll come back later. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for that. Uh, Lucy, was this your point on this or, or another one? Um, I had one on this and another one, so oh, okay, equally. Okay. I'm happy for you to... Uh, and also, I think my one on this has mainly been covered, so... Uh, OK, I'll come back to you then if that's all right. I just, if it was a cluster of questions, I just felt it, it probably made sense to take them together. Martin, then, would you like to um, to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, so my... Thank you for the report. 
Um, I think looking at the facts of COVID and the inequality in Sheffield is really saddening and clearly there's lots to be done. Um, my question's kind of to the scale of the challenge, which is pretty huge from the amount of recommendations and addressing inequality across Sheffield nationwide and across the world is a huge challenge. Um, so how do we ensure that we and the council across like our man, many facets will do everything we can to action the recommendations and encourage the, our partners to do the same? So in this, I'm not really questioning our intent, like, or the recommendations themselves, which seem good, but kind of the scales, they're serious systematic issues and we'll need a similar concerted response. Um, and do we think it would be appropriate to um, basically take health and well-being closer to the heart of the council and commit to being a health, well, a well-being council or have a well-being economy within our council, um, like other um, local governments are now doing, such as Liverpool City Region and North Ayrshire Council have recently um, joined the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and basically putting health and well-being at the heart of all of their decisions and expenditure and committing to use well-being measures such as Happy City Index and alternative well-being measures for the economy like measured in the report. That's kind of a question to Greg and Eleanor, I guess, but also kind of to the chair and possibly Jackie. Thank you. Greg, did you want to... I, I, I suppose your answer is going to be yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, in short, my answer is yes. Um, so um, I suppose the key, the key thing is structure. Now, there's building this into hearts and minds, and we'll, you know, I, I am plenty on this call and plenty, plenty elsewhere ca carry this as a, as, as a torch um, um, and, and build it into hearts and minds. But um, building it into the, the structure and the way that we do stuff will kind of change the machinery of ours and other organisations and be clear the council can't do this by itself. Um, so I imagine a scenario whereby for every performance metric that we that we that we keep a track of and there are probably hundreds of them i don't know um the gap between best and worst was as was as important as the direction of the metric itself and not just the geographical gap but the gap between disabled not disabled mentally or not mentally ill um easy to say and we've mooted it before but it's, it's quite difficult to do technically but not impossible um, um imagine a scenario whereby um we treated um, well-being with the same level and, and the gap in well-being with the same level of gravity um, as we treat financial balance that requires fundamental re reorganization of accounting systems um, and the 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 um, long-term planning as opposed to short-term planning so it's easy for me to say those things but hard to agree but in short yes I agree um, um, on the well-being economy it's worth a, a, a read of uh, the New Economics Foundation report on, on, on um, um, well-being economy that's published this week, the 300 odd recommendations. Some of those are national. In fact, many of those are national. So um, we will try to do this, but many of the answers do, re do rely on kind of structural shifts within the Treasury. Lots of governments have gone down this path, most famously Scots, Kiwis, um, the, the Welsh have going down this path. Um, um, uh, nationally, there's merit in it. Um, that requires a political decision. Locally, there's merit in it, but it, it, you know it's a political shift that we need to engineer, and that's not not for me to answer. But it may be a recommendation that you the the, the scrutiny committee puts. Okay. Any? Oh, I suppose it's, it's Jackie's. Jackie's had to go. Um, I just like I just like in response to your sort of question, which also included me, Martin. Um, you, you've been here. Uh, I've been here a longer time than you, and I've seen such a shift in a culture of the council in relation to uh, public health and health and well-being since I've been a council, since we've actually had um, public health as part of, of the council. Um, so, for example, I know that with the work that Greg's done and, and also the way his, his staff have been embedded within directory, uh, directories, that, that, um, uh, that public health and health and well-being are fairly well embedded in, in our culture now in a very different way to what it was say 10 years ago and so on. So those are, I don't know if other colleagues who've been here over that period of time would agree with me. So for example, I remember we were talking about the, you know, the, 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 the local plan and policies and stuff like that, that a lot of the stuff about health and well-being were actually built into to, to some of the policies and things like that where they wouldn't have been in the past. 
So I don't think it's perfect. I think we've made a lot of progress. I still think we've got a way to go. That's that, that's my view as, as a as chair of this committee. And also I, I have been the cabinet member responsible for public health in the past as well. So um so you think that's a fair assessment, Greg? I mean, obviously you you are you know, you, you weren't here before it happened, uh, you know, but um before the uh, local government took on responsibility but I was thrilled when when public health became a, a local government responsibility because I feel that that, that that councils can do um, so much more um, to to affect health than the health service actually can so um, and I don't think we're perfect but I think we made a lot of progress um, I agree um, that's a very fair assessment um, if you'd asked me 10 years ago should public health be a, a local government function I'd have said no um, completely no. Ten years on, I was so wrong. Um, it should absolutely be a public, uh, local government function, and it, it's work in progress. It's a fourth painting the fourth road bridge type of job. Um, um, it will always be shifting and iterating. But uh, um, I think we've broadly set a direction of travel. There's a there's there's always more to do. Um, 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 uh, um, uh, but but in the, the short answer to your question, Martin, is yes. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you for that. Did you want to come back, Martin, or were you happy with that response, or those responses, rather? I'm, I'm happy with that response, but I guess that's a question for us to think about as a board, whether we would like to recommend that we should commit as a council to being a, a well-being organisation. Um, so maybe something to think about and appreciate everyone doesn't have the details. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. It's just whether or not we bring additional, you know, there'd be added value and maybe if you'd like to circulate um, or Greg might want to do that, then I'm, I'm happy for us to give some further thought to that at some point if we want to, to consider that. Okay, thank you. Uh, who have I got now? Um, Lucy? Yeah, so my question about vaccines was mainly around sort of physical access and disabled people, actually. I think it's been covered, so I won't go back to that. Um, so I had two other questions. Um, one relates to the um, Marmot report and this discussion that we've been having about that. As um, Greg, you've, you sort of rightly said, the sort of bulk of those recommendations in the Marmot report are uh, national recommendations. Yeah. Um, but there are some things there that can be picked up and... Um, worked on locally and I was just wondering where as a council we were kind of um, actually pulling together which of those marmot recommendations we could do some take some action on locally and sort of how explicit the commitment was to doing that and where that sort of explicit commitment is. Um, my second question is completely unrelated to that so I don't know whether or not you want to respond to that or do you want, do you want me to say my second question? As well, I'll do, I'll do the first one quickly. Um, so, so the the it, it, usually it's public health professionals that get the job card of um, sorting out health inequalities. Um, uh, caveat: um, we can't do that by ourselves. Sadly, it does require sort of a whole organisational city effort. Um, but it's usually public health professionals that get landed landed with the job card. Um, the, the honest answer to your question is we haven't done, we haven't systematically been, I, well, I haven't, I don't know whether Eleanor has, systematically been through the most recent Marmot report um, to pick off which of those are definitively things that can, should be done locally and which probably require government intervention. The, for, the, for one reason and one reason only, um, we're a bit busy um, with the obvious pressing thing of the moment. Um, so I haven't even read the most recent Marmot report. Yeah, I've clocked it and I have a copy of it on my desktop and I might try and read it at some time. But um, the, the honest answer is we as a department, Ellen may have, but uh, as a department uh, or I think as an organisation, we've not been we've not been through it because our priorities are elsewhere with kind of in the immediate pressing stuff. Um, so sorry to have to, I'll be honest with you, but that's where no, we are. That That's, no, that, that's fair enough. That's entirely reasonable, Greg. I just... Um, can, yeah, can, I, sure, can I just say that was my question as well? Oh. Uh, it's going to be one of my questions because, in fact, those were the sorts of things I was hoping then we could, we could actually include in, in recommendations from, from today's meeting. So uh, the only thing I, I remember offhand, Greg, was the stuff on air quality. Um, that's the only thing specifically that I remember from, from, from the, the most recent Marmot, Marmot report because most of the recommendations were quite structural and they were for government. Um, but anyhow, um, maybe that's something that we, perhaps you could include in your DPH report, for example, or, um, but anyhow, um, it's something we need to come back to, because I definitely think that um, yeah. 
but because otherwise we put stuff in the too difficult box, don't we? <laughs> and then we talk big picture structural stuff and we don't address the issues it's like climate change as much as anything else. And that's one of the other things that, that, that Marmot does actually highlight as well, how significant that is in relation to health inequalities. So, Greg, have you got any suggestions then about how we might um, take that forward? Um, well, Eleanor was sticking around the Pominigo, so she may have suggestions. Oh, sorry, sorry, Eleanor. Well, no, I, I was sort of half coyly, half half putting my hand up, um, partly because I just wanted to just for a minute big up. I, I'm going to call them my team for a minute. They're not, but the authors of this health impact assessment. Uh, again, I'm busy. I've not had time to read the the recommendations from the Marmot report in detail. But actually, they're the same as the recommendations in the local health impact assessment, which was written before Marmot wrote his. Um, and what we have committed to is just making sure that the, the, the detail in there isn't going to get missed. And that, that will be very slow. And of course, we will align it with the Marmot report. But I suppose what I'm saying is it is all already there. It's, mm -hmm. it's the same. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm literally looking at it now beside me and thinking, well, yeah, we use different words, but it's co we've covered that. We've covered that. Um, with, respect, uh, with respect, it doesn't come over in that way because mom is very clear in terms of short, medium, long term. It's much more strategic. And there's quite an issue when you've got whatever it was, 85 or 100 recommendations or whatever. Um, that that can be quite difficult to prioritise and, and, and to... to um, to address in a systematic and strategic way. So I still think there's a little bit more work that we need to do actually to prioritise what the local things that, that we can do, I suppose I'm saying. And so I agree with Lucy on that point. Yeah. Um, Lucy, did you want to ask your second question? Yeah, uh, this was really just following up on um, Adam's question at the start of the meeting, really. I'm mindful that our response to Adam was that um, disabled people wouldn't be forgotten and I'm just conscious that actually there hasn't been much discussion during this uh, meeting of that that group of people um, and I think I'm right in saying that um, over 50% of people that have died as a result of COVID are uh, people that are disabled so they've been impacted by this pandemic um, possibly more than any other group um, and I appreciate um, that sort of aspects of their experience will run throughout the different chapters of the rapid health impact assessments but I'm just wondering what we need to do now um, as a city to make sure that we keep hold of um, or, or keep sight of what experience people have had and actually probably still need to do quite a bit of work to find out more what, about that experience because a lot of the people that we're talking about by definition actually will have been potentially excluded from a lot of the intelligence and the sort of feedback that was gathered into that assessment and we probably still don't fully understand the extent of the experience they've had so just what our plans are to make sure that we get hold of that information and use it well. That's a very good and challenging question. Um, anybody, did, Greg, did you want to have a call uh, to Dawn? Can't, can't answer. Don't, don't know, and I'm, I'm being brutally honest here. Um, so 80% of those who've died who've, uh, have been um, over 70. Um, it, it's the age that's the primary driver of risk of death. Um, um, there will be a lot of age-related disability in that, there's no doubt about it. So I'm not saying that you're wrong, but it's the age that's the primary driver. Um, it, it, I think it, it is a, it, it, a, a blind spot is too strong a word for us. I don't think it is a blind spot, um, but it, it, it is, as you've correctly said, it's, the, the, one of the things that we forget, we forget at our peril, um, the, the light has been um, very brightly shone on um, the black and minority ethnic populations and the impact of COVID, rightly, um, no, you know, no two ways about that. Um, 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 and uh, the, that's not the wrong thing to do, but that's not to say that the impact on the disabled population has been any less. Um, the light hasn't been shone there. But I, 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 I can't give you a coherent answer as to what, what our plans are as a city, because it's one of, my, one of my blind spots and weak spots. So I will take that away and work out what the right answer is. But sitting here now, it's one of my, one of my, one of my areas of weakness. So there, there's a, another point of honest, hon honesty for you. I mean, there is some stuff in the Marmot report about the impact of containment 
that's a horrible word, but that's con- yes, that's the word you use, isn't it? But lockdown, basically, on um, higher levels of anxiety and so on around people with disabilities and so on. So there's different as there's the morbidity, mortality, and also the impact on you know of, of lockdown as well on on, on mental health, etc. Can we have a conversation outside this in case yeah. you know it's, it's it's potential Lucy, you and I potentially uh, um, you know have putting together a small working group or something because. You know, uh, um, we, we, you know, it won't necessarily fit into this program of meetings, but it's really important, and we don't want to to keep saying, "Oh, well, it's important, but we're not doing anything about it." So perhaps we could have a conversation outside the meeting with a view to actually sitting down and doing something specific on it. Maybe a, a task and finish group. Sorry, Greg, I, I wonder. I'll bring you back in. One, one of the things, because. I'm not cited on it. Doesn't mean that there aren't lots of people who are doing um, things in this space. Um, so um, I, I, my, my job is to get an answer on who is doing um, work in this space to pull together the um, um, cities, not just the council's response to the impact of COVID on disability. Um, we may still find that it's not half as strong as it needs to be. And, and if that's the case, then so be it. That's that's something that we need to address. But just because I'm not sighted on means that doesn't mean that there's nothing going on. Uh, sadly, I don't know everything by a long, long, long stretch. So, uh, but, but I'll still take the job card away. Uh, I'll bring you in a minute, Steve. Is, is it on, in this, on this point? Yeah. Um, I'll bring you in, in a minute. But what I was going to say, Lucy, as well, is I know there has been uh, quite a lot of discussion, probably in the public health group um, that, that, uh, that, I can't remember what the name of it was, you referred to it earlier, but certainly there has been on in the city, uh, on, in the city um, equalities partnership as well. Uh, I've been there and, um, and it has been discussed, but that's, let's, um, we need to bring that to the surface and, 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 um, and make sure that we as a city are doing enough about it. So let, let's have a conversation outside the meeting and see if there's, you know, we can do something a bit more. Uh, Steve, did you want to come in on this point? Yeah, yes, it was, uh, and I think Adam will be aware because he's uh, uh, um, on the Council of Governors of the Health and Social Care Trust, as I am. Health and Social Sheffield Health and Social Care Trust uh, have do have done some work on this and on service users. Uh, I'm just wondering if that might be one source um, that might be quite helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, Lucy, was that are you? Um... You got any further points you want to make, please? No, that's it. Thank you. Kate. No. And thank you for your questions. Sue, I'm sorry, I've, you've been waiting patiently. Well, I'm very patient. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've actually, as, I've, as, as the meeting's gone on, I've scribbled down more things to ask, so you see, that's what happens. Well, you're last, so there you go. You get a reward for your patience. <laughs> um, so they're all sort of, I think most of them fairly brief comments or, or questions. Um, just following on from the, the last comment, there are quite a lot of, well, I don't know the numbers, to be fair, of adults with significant disabilities who are in care provision, you know, um, sort of looked after care and support provision. And my understanding is that those people have been really quite severely affected by COVID. Uh, and I just wondered whether there was any prioritisation for them, along with the people who are in elderly care homes. I, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, my second point is, is there a role anywhere for the council in provision of transport? I'm just thinking we have a role in community transport and is that something we could offer the NHS to assist? Um, you know, we could offer to people. So I, I think that's something that somebody could take back to the council and ask. Um, a question to Greg and Eleanor. Um, is there work we should be doing now in terms of encouraging people who are not registered with a GP to be registered? Um, I think the way the system works is that they're using GP records. So if you're not registered with a GP, you're unlikely to be called for vaccination. And there are people, particularly um, recent migrants or some actually some really quite vulnerable people um, who they're probably not in the current age brackets that are being vaccinated, but as we get further down the line, those people could miss out if they're not aware that they need and how to register with a GP. Um, and then I've just got a couple of points really about uh, relation to mental health really among sort of, well, across the city, but uh, one thing is about bereavement services. I don't know if we feel that there is enough 
support and is there anything we can do to um, support the people who offer the bereavement support, if you like, um, groups and uh, charitable organisations, the voluntary sector, uh, because there are going to be a lot of people with a lot of mental health issues and working through around bereavement that's happened over the last 12 months. Um, and in a similar vein, um, people in uh, across the city who have got, because of COVID, I mean, some people probably were already in problems before, but it's going to be exacerbated, real problems with debt. And how much can we as a local authority support the organisations that support them and directly support people who've got issues with debt. So that's quite a wide ranging set of things, but. Um... Um, thank you. So, yes, off to start community transport. So, shall I ask, I'll, I'll start and I'll allow Eleanor to, yes, to, 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 to mopple my ineptitude. Um, on um, uh, the, the, those in an institution, uh, ad, younger adults with a disability, um, yes. Uh, yes, more more significantly affected. Um, on um, testing, I am awaiting the Department of Health and Social Care to start the testing program for um, those who are living in those who are living in um, sh uh, supported living or sheltered accommodation, um, uh, the, which people with disability will be in that context. Um, they have been promising to start weekly testing of um, staff and um, residents, individuals for about the last three months now, and they have not yet started it. Being brutally blunt, that's not good enough. Um, well, to, to their credit, the testing of those staff that work in care homes for the elderly is running, is running quite well, not perfectly, but quite well, and has made a real difference. No two ways about the fact that's made a real difference. Not solved all of our problems, but it's made a difference. Um, the, the risk of severe illness and death in younger adults, even those younger adults with a, a disability, isn't as great, but we still should be certainly testing staff, um, testing staff that go into those settings. On, on the of, of um, um, that group of people, I'm minded not to overly complicate the delivery, but allow the GPs who are sticking needles in arms that when there is a you know the cohort of people who are 60 to 70, if it's operationally possible, start with the most vulnerable 60 to 70 year olds rather than those 60 to 70 year olds who are very very well. Thank you very much. So start by definition, start with 60 to 70 year olds who have lots of medical conditions or who have a disability. That requires a bit of operational planning, but I think the, I think our GPs will be, in, will be in that space and try to do their best on that one. Um, on transport um, to and from to vaccination, for instance, yes, I think we're already in that space. I'll double check, but um, I think we're already in that space and have made that offer to the NHS already. Um, um, the NHS need, we need to be better coordinated with the NHS and the NHS needs to be better coordinated with us. And that just part of the messiness of putting together some of these programs quickly but I think we've made that offer and I think it's being taken up probably not as in as structured or systematic way as, as we'd want um, on um, registered with GP yes would it always makes sense to encourage people to get registered with a GP um, and we do reasonably well but there's always more we can do so uh, um, there, there will when we get to vaccination there will be significant effort made to get to the um, homeless and or injecting drug using population and or um, um, the, the uh, asylum seeking population, some who are most likely to be not registered with a GP. There'll be specific effort made to get to those populations, but it always makes sense to try and get people registered with a GP. Um, I'll Sorry to the... interrupt, but I think I'm just going off my own work experience. There's quite a lot of people among, say, the Slovak community in Sheffield who are not registered with GP. Yeah. So I, I think that's something yeah. that we just need to be aware of and yeah, uh, agreed. Um, um, I'll leave bereavement to Eleanor. Uh, on, on debt, yes, um, uh, the, the, the pandemic itself has exacerbated poverty that was already there. Um, and the, the most obvious answer to that is the um, the range of debt advice services that we have in Sheffield, most obviously Citizens Advice Bureau. They have noticed their demand go up massively over the last year. Um, they've put into place different um, different. Um, online and other phone-based mechanisms to increase their capacity to provide support to people, to obviate, not obviate, but to reduce the need for face-to-face -face appointments for everybody. Um, we, as an organization, continue to support CAB and long, long may that continue. But um, um, 
the, there's again there's always more that we can do that does require resourcing to do it and, and that uh, becomes a, a bit of a pinch point for us all as we know um, but CAB can and do do amazing stuff mm -hmm. in the space of problematic debt and, and uh, you know that has changed lives no doubts about that um, a bereavement if, if I may I'll leave to Eleanor because she knows more about that than me if I may. Eleanor, would you like to comment on that? Any of the other bits of Sue's questions or comments? The, well, the, the, the bereavement bit is, um, is, is the bit I have something of an answer to. Um, I think your question was, are there enough services? The answer is no, uh, never will be, probably. Um, there are, however, a lot more services now than there were pre-pandemic. It was quite a weak point in the system um, and uh, funding has gone into telephone brief services um that said this comes at a, a, um, a time when we were pre-pandemic we were trying to change our approach to end of life and bereavement anyway um and given the the shared experience of grief across the city and the large volume um there's a we, we need to do something a bit different now bereavement services are needed when bereavement becomes a sort of pathological thing that can't be managed with your close friends and family and talking out you, 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 death is normal um, at the moment it's happening in very abnormal circumstances it is very distressing um, but we, we we have work we're working with uh, partners at Sheffield Hallam University on how we can help people learn to talk more openly about loss and grief and um, culturally we are not good at talking about death and actually that leads us more into needing specialist services and the other thing is I don't know if people are aware I know a lot of councillors are involved with the citywide memorial work is anybody here aware of that um that um part of this is that the city needs a memorial um not just a, a, a giant statue at the end of the pandemic with hundreds of names on, but something live that's happening now that people can um, feel involved with. It's not unlike um, the Thursday clap, which, which people have different feelings about, but was a very shared event. Um, and so again, with academic partners, we are, we're kind of working on what can that shared expression of citywide grief loss shock whatever we're all experiencing uh what should that look like and i know there are a number of councillors working on that at the moment but i'm not seeing any recognition here so probably not people in this room okay sue did you want to come back on any of that no thank you that, that they'd be very helpful comments thank you thank you I'm sorry, Angela, I've got to bring you in now. You're sitting at the top right of my um, screen, so sorry about that. <laughs> I miss okay. you. So, do you um, want to continue now, please? Yeah, I, I suppose my question is for um, Eleanor, and it's um, more about the report. Um, thank you very much for the report. However, the report is obviously a few months old, and I was just wondering whether... Uh, the, I, and I'm totally, you know, aware of how overworked everybody is and, you know, not necessarily having the resources to do all the research. But in terms, of, for example, um, of the assumptions made about um, children and in particular, you know, things to do with school and how many uh, children are being homeschooled and the assumptions that are in that report. Is there going to be a follow-up? Are we going to look at the figures and see whether those assumptions were uh, correct or whether we were um, maybe um, too uh, worried about it and things have actually not worked in that way at all? And also, it would be interesting to, interesting to know how many of the children, particularly those who are in multi-generational um, uh, um, families and live in multi-generational -gener households, how many of those are classes vulnerable and how many of those are actually in school so we don't have to um, worry as much if you want um, about them. Um, but thank you for the report. It was very interesting for me. My, if this is a comment. My so concern is about how we can do things quickly because um, it's an evolving situation and things change rapidly 
um, and how as a council we can, you know, use our resources to the best um, 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 outcomes for some of the most vulnerable um, of our residents. Okay, there's quite a few comments there. Um, is there any response from either Greg or, um, or Eleanor? Well, there was a yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, certainly a response about you asked about a um, a, a follow up report and then some specifics about the numbers in the education chapter in particular. Um, the follow up report is interesting and it, it's one of my um, pre pandemic sort of interests really is in um, citywide high quality intelligence shared organisations, you know, how we find out what we need to know across the city. Um, and the issue is always people want good quality intelligence, but what they don't fully understand is that that needs resource. That means people bodies who earn income. It isn't just, you know, it isn't just there by kind of wishing for it. And I think that has become, that was really, really clear in this, in doing this piece of work. Um, we felt as we were preparing it that we would need a follow-up. Um, but we haven't, it is just a question of capacity, really, people to, to, Gather, gather the information and, and prepare it um, and I think the children so I, I can't answer the question about numbers of children I'm not a subject expert there but it's an interesting chapter that was particularly I don't say weak um, it, it was not one of the strongest chapters because people working in that area were just saying to us we're just too busy we just haven't um, so I, I think uh, one of the discussions we wanted to have with the Health and Wellbeing Board were, do they feel a follow-up report is needed, is appropriate? Um, but if the answer is yes, we need to think about capacity to do that. Um, because certainly we in public health are, you know, massively stretched. And, you know, a lot of this has kind of fallen to us, which takes us away from other, other things. In terms of how we mobilise quickly, Greg, can you answer that one? Um, well, the, the, so the honest answer is we won't be, the public health won't be mobilising quickly in this space because we're, 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 we're busy responding to a pandemic of um, um, the, the size of which none of us ever anticipated or ever wanted. So um, I, I, I genuinely, I can't give you a, I can't honestly say we will be mobilising quickly um, as a public health team to um, uh, be responsible for implementing this thing um, um, because it's a gi giant exercise. The, the city has to be responsible for addressing the, the, the recommendations that are set out. Um, I, I sort of accept there's a level of responsibility for someone to coordinate that and we are very, very short on our ability and capacity to coordinate that. So that will in itself become a rate limiting step which concerns me greatly. Um, but, um, it, 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 without it being pushed, it won't happen, um, and it needs to be pushed. Now, I'm not. I can't honestly sit here today and say I'm going to push this because I'm not. My eye will be taken back um, immediately. This call ends. I'll be going back to to COVID and pandemics and things like that. So um, I, that will become my problem. Um, and it will become something that I will be held accountable for. And that's fine. I'll, I'll accept that. But the honest answer is I won't be personally pushing this because I can't. I just can't. Sorry to have to be a bit bleak on it. I would say to you, Angela, I think, was it you that asked a question at council, uh, last council meeting? And, and um, uh, we had the response that, that there's going to be a schools audit that we're going to be able to see the impact of who's in schools and what's happening around the IT and stuff like that. I think there is a mainstream responsibility for recovery from COVID and, and we're right in the middle of it, in, it now and we're trying to work out what's been happening and, and so on but there's still I think you know there is a, a, a you know we, we're, we're neither in full recovery nor in, in, in full well we're, we are in um, full COVID mode at the moment so um, I, I think there's a mainstream responsibility and it isn't just um, Greg and, and, and his staff's responsibility or the health and wellbeing board I definitely see the cabinet would see it as their responsibility as well. Certainly, up to Samwood around schools to make oh, yeah. sure that, that, that schools were that their children were, were were appropriate arrangements were in place to recover some of the the learning challenges. Sorry, Greg. 
Yeah, yeah it, it is, and, and there is. So again, it's something I'm not sight on, but I will take it away. Um, Andrew Jones, who's the Director of Education, will, will have a reasonably good handle on the state of play of the intelligence. Um, none of us know how we recover the, the learning. There will have been no, no, no one knows that um, anywhere, probably in the world. Um, but that becomes one of the challenges of, rec of recovery. But so don't, me being bleak, don't assume that there's nothing in that space. It's just that I'm I'm not going to be personally responsible for it. Um, but there will be people who are. So I'll take again. I'll take the job card away of discussing with Andrew, who will have a reasonably good, if not perfect, mm -hmm. handle on it. And to be honest, Angela, the Children's Scrutiny, Health, uh, Children's Scrutiny Committee has already been looking at it as well. So there are actually things happening, which because we're an adult board, we haven't been directly involved in. So I was just sort of talking broadly around the, the stuff that I, I know is, is happening. Thank, so. you. Thank you. I wasn't assuming that it was the public health responsibility. I was just wondering about as a council, as an authority, how we yeah. work together. And um, thank you, Eleanor. I wasn't trying to give you more work today. I was just wondering whether you knew how things had panned out, you know, with those kind of assumptions in terms of figures. So I, I know that you work really hard and I know it's, you know, I wasn't trying to put more on your plate. And um, we're just, is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet who wants to ask a question, make a comment, Lewis? Yeah. Um... Uh, uh, apologies if this seems a bit random, it, but it, partly because of uh, what Greg's just been saying about the um, capacity being overwhelmed by COVID, I just wanted to ask um, about the, the water fluoridation, which we, you know, we discussed as a committee a while back. Um, it's jogged my mind because it, you know, we looked at it as a specifically as an instrument that could deal with some health inequalities around uh, around dental stuff. And I, and I understand if the work on that has been delayed because of a pandemic, but it, it would be a shame if so. Okay, so could you just very briefly, in the context of stuff, but for the record, just update us on where we got up to with that? Yeah. So um, where do we get to? Um, there, um, there was a recommendation made from scrutiny to cabinet that the engineering study was commissioned. They, there, was a de there was a desktop feasibility. Um, is it a good thing to do? The answer was yes, we knew that. Um, the, the next stage in the process was um, the commissioning of an engineering study. Um, can it be done? Where do you put the, the, the plant um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the, the water system and how much would it cost? That's been commissioned. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say that Yorkshire Water are being a bit slow with us. Um, um, and we are um, trying various shapes and means to get Yorkshire Water to actually give us the engineering study. It has been commissioned, not yet paid for, um, but, but, but being, being commissioned. But we need to have that engineering study to give us the, uh, the answer to the, the, the technical question. How do you do it? Where do you put the plant? How far up the water supply chain? And how much would it cost? Um, the, the answer to the how much will it cost will broadly be about a pound per head of population there or thereabouts. Um, so um, once we've had that, then that would probably need to go back to cabinet um, for a conversation about whether or not to trigger a the public consultation, because how clearly has to be a public consultation on this. Um, should we um, ask the water authority and pay for the water authority to, to do this. That's a pro proper question of public consultation. Um, but until we've got the engineering study, we can't progress to that. And being brutally blunt, um, Yorkshire Water are being somewhat slow. Um, and uh, to be fair, I've taken my eye off that particular ball as well, as has De De Debbie Hanson in my team who's, who's, who's doing that. But um, it's not been forgotten about. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pester Yorkshire Water on about a monthly basis at the moment, but I, I've got no leverage over them. I can't make them do it, sadly. Thank you. That's that's okay. really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I asked now because uh, partly because as, as you highlight with a pound per head, it actually is one of it what is the, one of the most cost effective ways of making yeah. public health intervention on, on, on this issue. So thanks yeah. for the yeah. update. Okay, thank you. OK, um, can I thank um, Greg and Eleanor for um, for all their work on, on this alongside the day job <laughs> as, as well? Um, has anybody got any suggestions for recommendations? I've got a couple of things which I've, I've picked up today. Is there anything anybody wants to um, tell it? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to know, you know, the recommendation we make, 
how long it takes, you know, and uh, how it goes, because, you know, as a committee, we just recommend, uh, but, you know, it's not our remit to implement because, you know, such as uh, uh, Lewis uh, raised that uh, question and uh, uh, I'm in fluoride, it's, it's a Yorkshire water and they didn't implement uh, up to now, uh, they're gonna take time. Uh, my, my question is in inequalities uh, such as, you know, uh, in BME communities, uh, uh, you know, the working class, uh, such as manual worker, they work longer uh, and uh, get paid less. And uh, uh, how we can close that gap uh, and such as in housing, poor housing, uh, I mean, such as in my ward, uh, Darnell ward, uh, Faith Park ward, uh, are others, uh, there is such poor housing uh, and how we can close that gap. Uh, and uh, the more importantly, digital uh, exclusion how we can close that gap, we, we can recommend, but you know, how long are you gonna take to close that gap? How are you gonna work uh, if anybody can comment? Thank you. Uh, I, I think how long's a piece of string, to be honest, and it certainly comes out of every every report that I've seen, and, and it is highlighted again in the Marmot report. And a lot of the responsibility is, as, is the responsibility of, of national government. However, there are specific recommendations in, in, um, uh, in, in, in the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board report as well. So did you, would you either of you like to sort of say something about what the um, response to Talib in relation to what's in your report about, the, about housing inequalities? Well, yeah, but you know, it's no, more I important, uh, you know, that uh, uh, digital exclusion, such as in these wards, yes. and you know, the connectivity uh, is uh, is not up to that standard. Uh, I, I mean, even like uh, uh, somebody mentioned about the, you know, uh, the new, uh, uh, you know, you know, the, the telephone, you know, uh, uh, is. Uh, but, <laughs> Even though, uh, you know, some areas, they haven't got uh, uh, the, the standard quality, it's very poor connect connectivity, uh, and it, it doesn't work, such as, you know, our colleagues here, uh, I mean, in different areas, uh, uh, it's poor quality, uh, and uh, we do disconnect, so how we can uh, improve that connectivity uh, is key. Uh, and poor housing is in a certain area of city, they are very poor, how we can, you know, uh, close the gap and uh, regeneration or uh, anything else, things like that. Well, I mean, um, those are sort of really big questions. We did sort of mention that those were taking place across the city and well, starting to take place around di a digital inclusion. Um, and I, as I said to you, I mean, obviously, we're very conscious of that as far as housing is concerned. And as you know, the council's actually building new council houses as well to try and do our bit in, in terms of redressing it. Was there anything from your report, though, Eleanor, that you wanted to um, comment on in relation to Talib's questions? I, I just think it's a big challenge that we all know is a challenge. And it's one of the first big, it's big one of the big fundamental blocks of public health, isn't it? Poor housing. and. Uh, that's one of the original um, uh, areas of, uh, for, uh, around public health, actually. Poor water, poor housing, poor air quality, blah, blah. So um, I don't think there's an easy answer to your question, actually, unless, unless somebody's got <laughs> a magic answer to that or a magic wand, rather. It's all about investment and, you know, um, all, a lot of these structural issues as well. Yeah, I've, I've got nothing nothing to add. I'm afraid I'm not a, a subject expert on, on housing. I don't know if you've got anything to say there, Greg. Oh, sorry. sorry. The, the honest answer is tell you I don't know. So, um, and I, I'm a, a, a ditto not a subject expert on housing. Okay, sorry about that. I mean, there isn't an easy answer, actually, Talib. Um, I mean, I, it's just part of our policy and we've got to keep working on it and got pressing, a lot of this is actually also pressing government uh, to take action to um, uh, for, for appropriate investment as well. Um, so on that note, anybody got any suggestions that they'd like to see as, as recommendations? I've got a couple picked up from what you've said today. Anybody want anything feeling very passionate about something that we've, we've been talking about today they want to 
Shall I make a couple of suggestions then and then see what you think? Um, uh, we, we have highlighted that there's a bit more work to do around um, what we can do locally in relation to the Marmot recommendations um, on from, from his latest COVID report and so on as well. We, we haven't really had an opportunity to do that yet because it's everybody's really busy actually firefighting. Um, so, so, that, so that's something we probably want to come back to. Um, and we, we, we've had some comments as well. We want to ensure that um, health inequalities are not exacerbated inadvertently through the vaccination programme. So we did highlight issues such as access and, and also sort of access to general practice and so on as being quite important, very important rather. And we want to work with, uh, as a council, we want to work with the NHS to make sure that we do play our part fully in ensuring that that, um, that doesn't happen. Um, and uh, for, for us as a, a scrutiny committee, we've highlighted um, that uh, given a, bit, a commitment that we want to uh, to look at maybe do a little bit of um, uh, where maybe a task and finish group on, on what's happening in, in relation to disabilities and COVID because we didn't know enough about that really and we want to make sure that we know what's happening so that's for us as a scrutiny committee this isn't uh, something that, that, that we are um, it's not an ask of, of, of you guys from public health um, anything that I've missed that people think is really important that they'd like to have you know and try and you know this yeah, I just just whether we could just finesse the point slightly. I mean, I, I think um, I don't want to completely take it out of context, uh, but when when Greg said earlier about about Burngreen versus Dawn Totley, and I, I get that, and I think uh, we've discussed aspects of stuff which which are spatial inequalities, but I think it would be really important to get a point in that the, the other point that we've discussed is the is the sort of the not the stuff that isn't as spatial, the disabilities, the um, migrants and you know and then stuff like that so uh, just some way with the equalities is it's both about the deprived parts of the city and the equality of areas but yeah. it's also equalities in a cross you know in a cross group way uh, yeah I'm, I'm 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 happy and it's, it's about commun communities of interest different types of um of of um, inequalities um can well can we We'll have a look at that, Emily, and just just sort of come up with a form of wording which which um, appropriately um, uh, describes that. Because I think everybody would agree with that point. We we do understand that there's a geographical dimension, but we also understand that that there are other indicate that there are other issues associated with deprivation and and, and so on. So, uh, Gary, did you did you want to comment or make a recommend suggest a recommendation? Well, it's just actually going on what Louis has just said, really. It's, uh, <clears throat> there's been a comment here uh, about the lack of uh, take up on GPs, you know, people not signing up. And I just wondered if we can have uh, a bit more clarity on that. Um, I, think, I think Sue was talking about, sorry, oh, oh, Craig, can you come back then? Did you want to? Gary, sorry, I, 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 you dropped out at a crucial moment. Just repeat the question, sorry. It's just that there's been a, there's been a, a mention today that uh, certain parts of uh, the community are not taking up uh, uh, an appointment system at the, the GP surgery. I think it's uh, about registering. registering. I think it was not about registering, registering yeah. the point that, that, that Sue made. I mean, that's not necessarily a responsibility for us as a council, but certainly something you know we, we remain concerned about. So is that a question we want to ask? I mean, we had a session on general practice um, at our last meeting. We did, um, yeah. So what is your suggestion that we do about it? Shall we ask the question about what they, um, what's happening, what, what the CCG is, is, is doing? We don't need to task Greg or anybody else with that, but there's still, um, I mean, we know about homelessness and, and specific provisions actually made in particular practices. Um, but, you know, I, I know nothing about the level of registration with general practice. It's um, just, it's so just it's, you're right, Jack. it's just the walk-in, you know, the walk-in, you know, uh, if, if, if the walk-in services are overwhelmed uh, and people aren't from a certain area not registering with their GP, that may be a bit of work for CCG to do. Can we flag that up and give it a further, further thought, rather than it being a recommendation for further action? Let's give it some further thought, because it's a really good point, um, but we can't necessarily, you know, take everything up at this point in time. 
Um, I'll have a chat with, with some colleagues to see whether or not we can get an answer to that question. Chair, Chair um, to, to has made a really helpful point on the chat about um, how we make communities aware of how to reach it. I agree 100% dead right. Um, and that is one of the things that the CCG are pursuing fairly aggressively at the moment. Again, there'll be bumps in that road, but, but I 100% agree with the point that Sue made. So it's about the how that, that we do yeah. that as well. So, I mean, if you want to take that as a recommendation and we think it's critical that we make people, communities aware of how to, to register i mean that's a different point isn't it and that's a really helpful one so happy to to accept that as a as, as a recommendation as well okay on that note anything anything else i'm going to draw this part of the meeting we've got another session uh, okay chair chair okay, i i think you know council have collected uh, start collecting data it's going to be helpful if we collect data for the communities and ward by ward uh, 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 which ward is not taking that, uh, uh, you know, vaccine? So we can highlight and uh, support the communities uh, if, if, if we've got the data. Greg, question on uptake, which bearing in mind is uh, not our responsibility, but. Uh, it's crucially important, um, I agree. So at the moment, I do not have data on uptake. Um, uh, every director of public health I know has said we need uptake on data. And there are two, 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 two elements. There is the, um, the, the numerator, the top of the, the equation, how many needles have been stuck in, our, in, in shoulders, and the denominator. I want it split by geography, by practice, by age, by ethnicity, by as many things as possible. At the moment, um, I think it's fair to say that there is almost no data uh, other than a very high level summary for the city. Um, and actually, NHS England is very, very nervous about data on this being made public for reasons I don't know. But I want data. Um, I absolutely want data. We can't run a vaccination programme without it, both in terms of level of coverage, but also who has been vaccinated and importantly who hasn't but should have been because then we can correct that so at the moment I don't have it um, uh, neither does the NHS have all of the data it needs so it's critically important and it is moving quite quickly. Okay so there's some reassurance on that point so on that note can I just thank Greg and Eleanor and um, uh, Jackie's had to go so apologies from her um, and so um, I've, all, I've thanked her anyway I, I thanked her uh, through the personal chat but thank you very much and and thanks for you know it's a, a really tough time for you guys um so um well done and thank you, thank you <laughs> see you on work. the other well side done. see you on the other side Hope so. Hope <laughs> you. Don't, no the rest of us we still we're not finished yet we've still got some some further work to do so thank oh, you Greg, no. Greg and Eleanor. you're not going the rest of you you're still you're not getting let off uh, you're not got an early dash uh, but we've just got the um, we've got to uh, the work program item E. Ellen, um, Emily, did you want to say anything about that? Um, we've we've made a couple of changes uh, since the last meeting. You highlighted dental uh, access to dental services during COVID as an issue you wanted to prioritise. So we've got that um, on for February um, alongside um, the, the care fees report before it goes to cabinet, and then we've got the session on mental health in March. Um, and that that's all we've got scheduled formally at the moment um that that's kind of takes us through to the end of the municipal year um and we've obviously got the recommendation from today about looking at um covid and disability and um, so that's possibly something to add on there but there's nothing really um to add from me unless anyone's got any comments questions martin unmute yourself <laughs> um, not to be a bit bleak about the prospect of elections happening or not happening um but is it worthwhile thinking about scheduling something in april and may in case they don't happen just as preliminary that we can always not do if a new committee is elected and then chooses to do something else it's just that i, I think it's likely they won't happen in may i was going to mention that possibility so yes let's we've already got some I mean, we've got some issues as well that, that we were, um, that are already in the potentials. I just think we, so if there's anything else, uh, if, if we have to do that, we would start to put in something I mean, um, from that list. Uh, but if anybody thinks there's anything that needs to be added into that list, you need to, to let us know. So I've got Jane and then Lucy coming in. So, um, so yes, I think that's a good idea. And 
um, potentially we, we, we would be drawing from the list. It's just so far we go in actually setting up meetings at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we'll need to have a corporate discussion on. Um, you know, uh, so we will take that away and, 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 um, and have a conversation about it, Martin. Thank you for the suggestion. Jane, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you said. Uh, Genrix just announced the elections are going ahead, which probably means they'll be cancelled on Friday. <laughs> um, but um, he has just announced that they will be going yeah. ahead in May. But, you know, I don't, I mean, we will know before then because there's a cutoff point, isn't there? Yes. You know, with um, sending That's literature it. down and everything. But if they are delayed, then it's because of major issues with the pandemic. So it's like having that contingency, isn't it? Do you know? Well, it's, it's also how quick whether or not they achieve their goal with the um, yeah the vaccination program. And mm -hmm. up to now, although it is something that we do locally, which gives me more confidence. Mm -hmm. Up to now, everything has been um, over promised and under delivered. So um, well, the bomb bond <laughs> shelling charge. Yeah. Aren't we? <laughs> Lucy, did you want to comment? Um, it was just a potential topic, actually, and I don't know how this would sit with timescales and obviously um, where it would go, but um, there's the care home fees review, which is coming up, but also there's some consideration underway, I understand, of the um, way that social care contributions are calculated, and there's some work which is um, some consultation that's likely to happen on that quite quickly it just to me it feels like a really important issue it links strongly to really poverty and the um experience particularly of disabled people in terms of their income and their ability to stay well it links very closely actually to what we've talked about today and i just wondered if there was any way of us um looking at that at any point but i know it would depend on capacity and time scales um well we'll find out what the time scale is on that first of all lucy and um, certainly we'll put that on the possible list but as you said we'll um every time we add something in we've got to take something else out um but again as if if we've got you know a longer term then um that might well if it fits in with the time scale and so on so yes we'll consider it and and but we'll see what we can do in relation to um time scale basically and and uh, logistics of that is that okay yeah that's great okay um so on that note uh, we, our next meeting is going to be uh, the 10th of February. Can I thank you all for your excellent questions and contributions to today's meeting? Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you felt it was useful. Um, it has taken us a little while to get this meeting together because, to be honest, our public health um, colleagues are just sort of really, really busy sort of trying to, you know, trying to manage um, a lot of the stuff around COVID and so on, operational stuff. So, um, but thank you. Uh, thank you for your contributions and um, you take care of yourself. And if it, we'll see you at council or at our next meeting in February. So thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.